My name's Amber Huff, and I'm going to be talking about resource politics today. In general, resource politics is concerned with the role of natural resources in development. Traditionally, resource politics has two broad areas of focus, the politics of access and resource conflict. The politics of access is often framed in terms of dialogue and critiques of rights-based versus market-based resource management regimes, and it aims to understand politics around claims to benefit from productive and sociocultural interactions between humans in the physical world. Resource conflict studies focus on conflict and its causes in relationship to development. In this presentation, overall, I want us to reflect a bit on the question of how do we in our diverse roles and in different places and positions relative to power make sense of and take on the emerging resource politics of the 21st century. We begin with a reflection on the nature of nature and natural resources themselves, and then review some recent trends, um, talk about some issues and approaches to resource politics, um, and discuss particularly how we can unmask the politics and contestations behind different framings of crisis and how those framings are related to conflicts and struggles that coalesce on resource frontiers. In my research as a political ecologist, I'm particularly interested in how discourses about people, markets, and the environment shape the ways that we understand overlapping problems that we face, and the sorts of actions that can flow from those different understandings. Considering that resource politics is an area of research and practice that transcends any particular discipline or way of knowing and relating to the world, I argue for what has been called an undisciplined agenda for understanding resource politics. This agenda is more richly political, more historical, more critical and more plural than has been dominant, particularly in academic or policy focused research on resource politics in the past. To begin with, I want us to just take a moment to think about what we see in this image. Now, of course, this is a landscape. This is Yellowstone National Park. Um, see a picture of a waterfall and forests and stone outcroppings. But just think about this, what comes to mind? Usually in a classroom when I ask these questions, what comes to students' minds are things like the idea of wilderness, nature, pristine, untouched. And then when I ask what sorts of resources do you see in this image, people might discuss things like water, like minerals, like forests, potentially carbon. Some might even say um, hydroelectric power uh, because there's a waterfall there and there's a river. When you look at this image, you see four things. What do these things have in common? So I guess um, this is a lump of graphite. This is a lump of coal with a diamond in it. And this is a tree. Um, the reason that I chose these different images together are because these all in different ways represent or, or manifest what we think of as carbon. But the reason that these things are valuable despite the fact that we associate them all with carbon is because we attach different values to different things. So again, if we were in a classroom, I might ask what of these images is the most valuable? Somebody might say diamonds because uh, of everything pictured that might have the highest price in a shop. But then if you're a teacher, you might point to graphite because that's what makes pencil lead and that's what students use when they're learning to read and write. Somebody who's particularly interested in sustainability issues might say the tree because of uh, the like carbon sequ sequestration potential of that tree. Somebody else who's interested in uh, the energy sector might point to coal. The point is there are different ideas about what makes a resource important based on the values that people assign to them. 
Natural resources are usually thought of as materials or substances that are created through natural processes and exist in the environment prior to human extraction. What specifically makes something a resource is that it's considered to be useful in some way. And through some sort of transformative process, it's made to satisfy human needs or wants, either directly or indirectly, uh, and support human life and well being. But resources, just like the images of carbon I showed, resources are contested. Um, they might be contested because of different uh, disciplinary perspectives or orientations. So, from a biogeophysical perspective, um, not all resources are qualitatively the same. From a biophysical standpoint, resource properties, applications, demand, and use patterns, as well as sustainability issues vary quite a bit according to the type of natural resource we're talking about. For example, are we talking about minerals versus land, renewable versus non-renewable, fast versus slow replenishment, as well as the sorts of transformations that something undergoes in the process of production. Likewise, resources characteristics vary a lot in regards to relationships with other resources and substances, both in situ as they occur naturally and in extractive production and consumption contexts. From a conventional economic standpoint, natural resources are often framed in terms of investable and transferable natural assets, forms of quote, natural capital and environmental goods. These are measurable materials and substances that exist in the natural world separate from and prior to humans. They're sorted into typologies on the basis of their origin, their development status, their relative renewability, and their biogeochemical qualities. And it's commonly taken for granted that resources have economic value, for example, in terms of utility or price, because they support human life and economic activity through their role and their material transformation in capitalist processes of production. Now, from a critical and constructivist perspective, um, it's important to understand that a resource, whether we're talking about extractive minerals, hydrocarbons, wind, or ecosystem services at different scales, is something that's brought about socioculturally. So resources also should be considered to vary in terms of their historical construction and the values, characteristics, and meanings that are ascribed to them by different actors with different interests and priorities from natural scientists to economists to social scientists and lay people. So in terms of the implications, similarly contested are divergent notions around the appropriate uses, management techniques, scarcities and sustainability challenges that are associated with different types of natural resources. This highlights the issue of contestation, which is a really central concern to research in resource politics. Contestation is the process of levying competing claims to something. So in terms of natural resources, contestation happens around everything from basic definitions to valuation and values, appropriate uses, management regimes, rights to access, control, and derive benefits from them. This reflects that the property of being a resource, um, what researcher Tanya Murray Lee calls something's resourceness, has to be actively brought about. Now, I think this is a great quote at the top of the slide for demonstrating what this means. Tanya Murray Lee writes, land by itself is not the abstract entity that we call land and think of as a resource. Before it is land, it's the ground, earth, soil, forest, pasture, ancestral territory, place of spirits, any number of particular designations its resourceness and its investability have to be brought into being by imaginative and discursive devices and new practices. This way of thinking about resources is important because it challenges us to examine resources not just as things, economic objects or commodities, but as a conceptual, theoretical and comparative problem. Beyond even how resources are constructed by different actors, we can go on to what is called their materiality, which refers to the ways that things, things contribute to shaping the construction of broader politics, the way they contribute to the construction of social life, as well as landscape. 
Resources have biophysical properties, and these can be associated with contested notions of value, like we discussed before. This contestation generates politics around them. In other words, different types of politics tend to coalesce around different types of resources. For example, because of the way it occurs in nature as deposits, Oil can allow for very specific forms of centralized capital intensive technologies of extraction. And this leads to particular politics. Um, you can look at the research of Michael Watts, for example. By contrast, the fluid nature of water makes it variable across time and space. And this leads to a dislocation of effects. For example, across ground and surface water, there are upstream and downstream effects. And all of these have implications for issues concerning control and capture. Um, Lila Mehta at IDS has written about the slippery nature of water grabbing. Now land, you know, sometimes we talk about how land is the apex resource. Um, but this is because land is really complex and multidimensional, which is why so many conflicts that are ostensibly about other resources get tangled up in conflicts over land. Land can be a spatially fixed aspect of landscape and territory, um, but it can also be a resource that produces food or other resources like forests on its surface. At the same time, land can also cover things. It can hide and reveal other resources that lie underneath it. When we think about resources as commodities and exclude other ways of valuing them or other ways of understanding them, it can be really easy to sidestep the very, very important politics and the justice issues that come with it around them. I mentioned before that I tend to approach research politics from uh, resource politics from a political ecology standpoint. Um, so how does political ecology link up with resource politics and a steps approach? Um, I want to give a very brief kind of introduction. Um, and the answer in short is in lots of ways. So political ecology, really broadly speaking, focuses on issues of environmental change. Um, and this includes policy processes and forms of intervention, not just what we think of as natural processes of change. And it situates these in relation to broader historical and political economic systems and processes. So politics is really central to understanding environmental change and environment and it, oh, sorry, um, and identifying pathways to sustainability, um, as well as for situating emancipation and justice considerations in social environmental relations. And this is the case from the micro or local context to broader and even global systems of power. So some aspects of political ecology's approach that are relevant to pathways thinking um, include an interest in one, opening up the politics behind resources and policy through critical inquiry and analysis. Um, what we call unmasking or revealing hidden relations, agendas and forms of power and domination that can be obscured by particular discourses or particular forms of authority. Broadening out means valuing plural knowledges, multiple forms of knowledge, multiple voices, and multiple sustainabilities in order to identify overlooked ideas or pathways forward. Highlighting alternatives to dominant values in social environmental relations is a really important part of this. And the reason that we might look to alter, uh, sorry, might look to overlooked ideas might might want to know what's being obscured through power relations. And ultimately, a lot of these boil down to the interest of seeking justice, seeking to bring about a more just world through our research, through our solidarities, through our practice, through our communications and other forms of action. Um, and I think to me, particularly, the bottom line is that there's a more equitable, less violent, and more sustainable way of managing our affairs than those that characterize our dominant growth focused and honestly ecocidal social and economic relations. When we talk about opening up the politics behind resources and policy through critical inquiry and analysis, 
a lot of times we're talking about understanding how power operates through the language that we use and the stories that we tell about contested environmental issues. One of the most useful tools for critical analysis, whether in research or even in our everyday lives, is learning how to identify when an issue is being depoliticized. When something is depoliticized, this means that contestation, conflict, uneven effects on different groups or regions, the politics who wins and who loses, are being hidden or obscured in a powerful narrative. So how do we use critical thinking to know when a narrative might need further scrutiny or opening up? So I put together here on this slide um, what I think of as kind of a toolkit for critical analysis, a toolkit for identifying depoliticized narratives and kind of opening up the politics behind big stories that we get told, stories with lots of author authority and power dynamics that might obscure underlying relations and contestations. So I think the first and easiest step is to look to the structure of any particular narrative. Global climate change, biodiversity loss, poverty, and inequality are all complex issues that are so big and are produced through the interaction of so many factors that come together in different ways, in different places, that it's hard to even think about them. These are what some scholars cause, call wicked problems problems that are unruly, resistant to so-called rational policy approaches, and are inherently complex. So when we're offered a simple linear story about an issue like this, a red light should go off. Depoliticized narratives are often offered to us in a tidy little package, a simple linear story that identifies the problem, assigns a discrete cause or set of causes, and proposes a common sense solution. A good example of this is the idea that climate change is caused by economic externalities and that the solution is to turn to green growth. This doesn't only apply to global stories. However, it can pertain to claims made about complex phenomena at any scale, like land use change, water pollution, or crime. Now second, these simple stories might be accompanied by messages of crisis, urgency, and fear. What does this do to debate? Well, what it does is messages of crisis, urgency, and fear that convey the idea that there's no time to deliberate, that we have to take action by any means available, is this shuts down space for deliberation and dissent. And it makes one proposed pathway, one proposed solution, appear as if it's the only reasonable choice, that there's no time, that there's, there's no flexibility, um, or possibility to, to debate. And this just, this just shuts down the conversation. Third, a depoliticized narrative might be framed in ways that appeal to scientific authority, but at the same time distort or distract from the bigger picture or context. Scientific techniques like abstraction and metrification can isolate an object. Um, they, can, they can make you focus on on something that's removed from the social and biogeophysical processes, relations, histories, conflicts that really constitute it. Um, I mean, you know, we can think of cases like landscape fires, carbon, tigers, or even nature itself. Um, and what this does is it makes it appear uncontested or a simpler thing to control or manage if you take it away from its messy and complicated situated relations. Now fourth, related to, um, related to scientific representations, um, and I'm not being anti-science with that at all. I'm talking about how, how scientific authority um, and scientific techniques can be used to isolate problems in, in particular ways that give rise, rise to these politics. Um, but related to this um, is the issue of knowledge power dynamics. Knowledge, whether it be scientific knowledge or cultural assumptions about how the world works are not value free. The ways that knowledge is mobilized to explain social and environmental problems can often privilege particular worldviews and particular sets of interests and claims over others. Powerful depoliticized narratives about environmental problems often privilege a common 
dominant set of assumptions about people, ecology, change, and solutions to crisis. In turn, these assumptions privilege specific types of knowledge. For example, bureaucratic knowledge, quantitative modeling, neoclassical economics, neo-Malthusian assumptions, etc. Um, and also at the same time, they privilege particular actors who tend to be politically or economically elite. Opening up politics means always asking the question, who's heard and who is silenced in a given proposition? Just like the language of urgency, crisis and emergency can shut down debate. Authority and objectivity can be weaponized to shut down debate and undermine opposition. Things like, it's just the facts, it's objective science. These are easy ways to invalidate legitimate challenges or debates. And fifth, I just wanna highlight why this is important. And this is also part of the toolkit, keeping in mind the idea that depolitic depoliticization um, is dangerous because of what it does, because it obscures and hides contestation, conflicts and struggles. It hides uneven geographical and social impacts of particular problems or proposed courses of action. Um, and this is exemplified in things like win-win-win narratives of the green economy or win-win-win um, promises of more recently nature-based solutions. Anytime somebody offers you a win-win-win, that's another thing that should set off that red light, that red flag, that something that there might be depoliticization happening. Being able to identify politics and depoliticization is a useful analytic tool. Um, it allows us to address questions like whether contestation around an issue might be an effect of, for example, different disciplinary perspectives, or may, maybe it's associated with the expansion of power of specific groups or networks of actors and interests at the expense of others. We can always look at what's happening behind powerful narratives in regards to specific types of development related or environmental problems. We can always ask who is heard and who is silenced in policy debates. How are fundamentally political processes made to appear common sense, neutral or value free? How do these views affect development success? What are the goals and how are the consequences for people in ecology framed? Who ultimately are the winners and losers of any proposition? Now, I like to talk about um, that, you know, toolkit for critical analysis, tool, toolkit for identifying depoliticized narratives, because the landscape of 21st century resource politics is virtually littered with them. Um, the landscape of resource politics is complex. It's shaped by overlapping issues. Um, the global economic system continues to be affected by commodity booms and shocks of the overlapping crisis of the 2000s and is now facing the effects of global pandemic, um, global pandemic disease, growing economic inequalities, climate change, et cetera, um, amidst fears of things like breach planetary boundaries, um, there are dominant scarcity and security discourses that are increasingly tangled up with the rhetoric of sustainable growth and environmental management. Um, and this can justify the intensification of exclusionary relations of governance, um, also of accumulation and control as, and, and these get framed as both the only option and things that must be done for the greater good. So, I mean, that those are definitely areas we're thinking about um, the politics of claims making becomes very important. These, inter, uh, these issues are intersecting really crucially around issues of scale, governance, and, and control. And I'm talking about social control, but also control of resources and more broadly nature. And this plays out in ways that we're quite familiar with, um, most likely. So, um, this can play out in the form of dispossession as resource development is increasingly associated with the movement toward resource privatization and land enclosure. Um, and what this does is it concentrates control of resources with economic and political elites 
and, and can have detrimental effects on real economies, ecologies, and societies. And this is true in both the global north and the global south. Um, the world is becoming increasingly treated as capital. Like we see this in nature with natural capital, but really, you know, social life as well is becoming um, monetized and financialized, capitalized all the way down. Um, as they say, through commodification, marketization, and financialization of nature and social life. And what this does is it seeks to abstract, abstract, sorry, and extract as price, the myriad and contested values that imbue landscapes, social life, social reproduction, like all of the things that we think of as, you know, our environment and our, our social groups and our families um, and nature. Um, so it manifests in violence, and this is resulting from the intensification and the militarization of extractive activities, conservation, um, and other forms of resource development. And this includes those that are claimed for climate mitigation and ostensibly, you know, cozy things like wildlife conservation activities. Um, and this violence often happens at rural margins of really, you know, that the edges kind of of state power and government power and government control. Um, and all of this is happening in the context of increasingly fragmented state capacity to regulate industry um, and a fragmented state capacity to ensure that the rights of less powerful actors are respected. And this gives rise to new forms of struggle over resources, new social movements asserting claims to resources and also alternative notions of sustainability and development. So in this changing political economic context, the view of social and environmental problems has become really dominated. So if you look to the media, if you look to what resource, research, excuse me, is privileged in policy, um, the view of social and environmental problems has really become dominated by a global or a planetary framing, what we call the planetary story. And this is a story, um, story of things like earth system science of global modeling. And this really is a discourse that is driving global politics in quite significant ways. So within this planetary discourse of crisis and global sustainability, um, we often see um, an undifferentiated humanity um, cited as the culprit of overlapping um, environmental problems and breaching planetary boundaries, surpassing limits. Um, we, we hear stories about how the, uh, the Holocene safe operating space for humanity has now ended with the um, advent of the Anthropocene and the, the transformative effects of humanity on nature um, and the biosphere itself and geology itself, um, this has put humanity in peril because we don't know if we can survive outside of um, Holocene norms. We don't know if we can adapt to these changes. And you know, within this planetary story, you know, some might call like Johan Rockström, um, who's associated with the planetary boundaries concept, um, he, uh, he called in a, in a speech he gave at IDS once, he called for stewardship from above to manage a finite environment, environmental budget. And so what this, what this says to me is, you know, that we, we're treating um, problems as, you know, as global, as planetary in scale. Um, and we're also treating them quite economistically a finite environmental budget. Does this mean that we, you know, we can balance that budget like a bank account? And what does stewardship from above mean? That's not coexisting with nature. That's, that's ruling or, or managing nature. Um, it's a very kind of like authoritarian tone to that idea. And this is uh, exemplary of this planetary story. Um, and there's of course a new urgency and control behind policies, um, particularly control-based policies that, that seek to apply you know, management techniques and new governance technologies to local landscapes, to people and to ecology. Um, and this is you know, governance technology, surveillance technologies, new forms of securitization, things that we've already discussed a bit. 
So this is all indicative of the, the kind of planetary approach to crisis. And this should have quite a familiar feeling because this is um, really the story that, that tends to dominate um, journalism, um, you know, online, you know, if you look, I mean, what's clickbait, you know, disaster is clickbait. And, you know, the planetary story is the one that has traction. Um, but, you know, this is one story. Um, and we, we need to ask whose interests and whose claims and whose politics do such framing support. And I think it's really practically important when we think about planetary framings um, to ask who can engage at the planetary level. Um, is this something that we can engage with, that everyday people around the world can engage with and intervene in? Um, or is this something that is, is very much dependent on having quite a bit of social and economic power? Um, so where is the power located in the planetary story? What sorts of relations and dynamics are being obscured by this? This high level, this aggregate notion of, of the planetary. Um, and we can ask you know, about power relations and dynamics in relation to people, social power relations and inequalities. We can talk again you know, about uses, values of resources and resource management practices. We can talk about what sorts of social and natural histories and processes of change get left out when we talk about planetary crisis and biogeochemical physical thresholds um, and, and just really leave politics and um, economic histories out of the story. So when you tell it to planetary, uh, when you tell the planetary story of crisis, in other words, when you tell this story of crisis in humanity at the planetary scale, possibilities really do collapse. Solutions require, you know, a more authoritarian approach, ever tighter bureaucratic control, more policing, more enclosure to achieve this stewardship from above. Where is the room in this story for alternatives, for different pathways, for different ideas about what sustainability entails? Stories about environmental change are powerful, or at least they can be. And in many instances, um, narratives of scarcity, environmental collapse, and powerful ver verbal and visual imagery of ecological crises are used to secure control over things like forests and forest-based resources, and to justify dispossession, enclosure, and value appropriation by states, quasi-private agencies, companies, even specialist communities, even researchers at the expense of local farmers and forest dependent peoples. Um, this is only really increased with the growing prevalence of authoritarian and market driven environmentalist approaches that are backed by discourses of planetary crisis and salvation through things like fortress conservation, environmental offsetting, carbon forestry and similar schemes. So just to give you an example from my research, um, powerful stories of environmental crisis in Madagascar get embodied in images like those of subsistence farming represented on the left and aerial views, uh, the eagle's eye view of forest fragmentation or that's labeled as forest fragmentation on the right. And what these images do is they appeal to the biases of you know, the Malagasy bureaucratic elite of northern donors and also of members of the public. I'm sorry. Um, and, and yeah, and also members of the public. So like, we don't just tell powerful stories with our words and our language. We also tell powerful stories with images. We let people tell themselves stories through the images that we use. These are, you know, selected images show some things, but they also hide others. So in Madagascar and framed in relation to planetary crisis, there's what I've called a national crisis narrative. It's actually similar to crisis narratives in a lot of other countries, um, but in Madagascar, there's a unique version of it um, that's reproduced over and over again since the pre-colonial period. Um, so like, this is like since, you know, 
the 1800s. Uh, and this narrative explains deforestation and habitat loss engendered by poverty, skewed economic rationality, high birth rates among direct users of forests. A key element of this national narrative is that Malagasy people who depend on forest resources are represented in terms that evoke the imagery of invasive species. So in policy, in national policy and in global media, this imagery of kind of an essentialized destructive rurality um, implies transgressions against you know, a greater good. You know, and you often see um, pictures like this that represent, you know, landscape burning because, um, you know, small scale farmers often use Swidden cultivation and one step in Swidden cultivation is uh, to, to clear an area for, uh, for planting um, and, and a burning of the, the ground cover is one of those steps. These powerful stories incorporate discourses of people, livelihoods, and landscapes that are often decontextualized um, or even counterfactual just so, just so stories. And they're used specifically because they appeal to outsiders in ways that generate funding for research and government programs. But they also actively enable and support the reproduction of uneven social relations, economic distributions, and social stratifications. So when we see pictures like this, um, it's, it's quite a beautiful picture, um, but it's also a quite disturbing picture because it looks like literally the entire landscape has been burned and is, you know, is, is flaming. But if you look more closely at this image, what you see is there's, um, there's been a fire in the close foreground to the camera, but then actually the rest of the landscape is just a pretty typical Malagasy dryland landscape with healthy baobab trees, which um, you know, in the dry season don't have leaves. Um, and also, you know, you see green foliage on the ground if you look closely. The way the lighting is in this picture, it looks like it was taken in early morning or maybe early evening. Um, so it makes everything look a bit darker and mistier. Um, but the sorts of emotions that you might have when immediately seeing this picture, you know, they could be quite strong and quite, you know, quite biasing when backed up by the powerful narrative about you know, historical, you know, historical land use change that came from naturalists who were just like touring the country um, in the 1800s. So more recently narratives of things like poverty traps, high birth rates, um, there's a discourse of the burning island, um, of environmental predation, these get reified through things like boundary mapping, biodiversity assessments, and the strategic deployment of social data in ways that um, can be construed as being quite overgeneralized or underrepresentative of um, the actual dynamics that are going on. And the consequences of this, um, you know, somebody might secure funding or might secure approval to create a protected area, but the consequences can be tragic for people um, who have few, if any, of alternatives to the lives that they know and that they value. Um, so that the survival and the cultural values of farmers, fishers, pastoralists, forest dependent communities who live much more Spartan and sustainable lives than we do who live in the UK um, become subordinate to the interest of elite actors in the national government, in places like, you know, in the World Bank, in WWF, for example. So yeah, I mean, this is something that I've, that I've, um, um, studied for my entire career and I'm, I'm quite passionate about speaking out against. So to give you an example about how this plays out in a particular case, um, so you know in much of my career I've studied conservation, um, but increasingly conservation is tied up with issues of extraction. Um, really you know um, yeah, and, and, you know, really kind of part of this broader thinking about um, resource investment and, and land grabbing and resource grabbing. So um, supported by land and investment policy regimes, the intensification of resource grabbing, whether you're talking about land, water, forests, or green grabs for ostensibly sustainable projects, 
These can alienate local users from productive resources and reallocate rights to benefit from them to private investors, government agencies again, and other actors who tend to be deemed more efficient and economically productive. This can cause resource shortages and physical, social, and economic dispossession on a local level um, in exchange for the promise of national economic growth. Whether or not it actually happens is another story. Um, so when used for you know, intensive agriculture, other forms of resource extraction, or so-called green projects, all of these can cause drastic transformations of landscape. So in a case from a recent project in Madagascar, um, just to give you a brief example, the Rio Tinto QMM Ilmenite mine in southeastern Madagascar has dispossessed hundreds of people from their homes and livelihoods at the mine site. Um, well, really, at a combination of sites around the city of Fort Dauphin in the southeast of Madagascar. So you have a mine site, quarry sites, and a local conservation area um, all around this one city. Um, and people have been dispossessed from their homes, from their livelihoods, um, without fair compensation or comparable livelihood replacements offered. Um, and if that weren't bad enough, the extent and negative local impacts of Rio Tinto's dispossession um, have been actually roughly doubled through a land grab, a green grab, for establishing a biodiversity offsetting area about 45 to 50 kilometers to the north of the city of Fort Dauphin. And this is ostensibly to compensate for Rio Tinto's clear cutting of rare coastal rainforest to make this mine that you see in this picture here. Sorry, I'm waiting to switch my slide. There we go. Um, the company, which now arguably has more power in the Anusi region of Madagascar in the southeast than even the government does, um, was allowed to make this green grab based on the claim, unsupported by evidence, that the forest would have disappeared anyway due to the activities of forest dependent people living in a village called Ansutsu. So people from Ansutsu are shown here on this slide. Um, and these photos are from um, when they were participating in a meeting about a recent IDS research project that was looking into um, their experience of uh, dispossession resource conflict related to this. Um, people from Ansutsu have been left in a really dire situation and experienced widespread hunger as a result of the biodiversity offset. Whereas before they were able to grow enough food for subsistence and even excess to sell um, on the markets. So many of Ansutsu's residents have continuously resisted against the dispossession, but they lack the sort of wealth and social power or political power at Rio Tinto's disposal. But in turn, Rio Tinto has been able to leverage the offset, the fact that they displace these people to create a conservation area um, as the basis of its claims to be an industry leader in so-called sustainable mining, uh, which I find just interesting. This is just one way in which global responses to overlapping crisis can play out in the social and geographic margins. So Rio Tinto is responding to these kind of global narratives around sustainability, offsetting, balance sheet environmentalism by creating biodiversity offsets. But actually what this has entailed is widespread conflict in the margins of Madagascar. Problematically, as in Madagascar, around the world, powerful interests frequently frame the causes of increasing inequality, environmental degradation, insecurities, um, through revived and very discredited, often quite racist, neo-Malthusian tropes about environmental change, resource scarcity, population growth, etc., rather than as the political problems that they are related to elite wealth capture, wealth outflow, um, and inequitable development policies. In the face of such claims, opening up the politics requires that we ask critically who gets to decide what degradation or sustainability means in practice, whose voices are being heard and who's being silenced. 
or who never even got invited to the table in the first place? Who ultimately benefits and who pays the greatest proportional price? We get told the story that it's necessary for these, these interventions are necessary, that, that offsetting is required, um, necessary for development, necessary for the planet. These are methods, messages of authority, of urgency that make us afraid. They make us afraid of change, of, of the future, and they can make it seem like there's just one way to rationally view global crisis and global action. The planetary view, the eagle's eye view, that there are no viable alternatives, that business as usual has to be maintained, and that those who are sacrificed must be sacrificed to the planet for the greater good. For a decade or more, popular culture has been incredibly obsessed with stories about consequences. And I'm particularly talking about stories about consequences to um, environmental change. Now, I mean, we could say that popular culture has always been obsessed with consequences, whether it's of warfare, of, of you know, nuclear war, of, you know, you know, visitation by extraterrestrials. But really, I'm talking about um, the eco-pocalypse. Uh, popular culture has become really infused with images of what this like ecological apocalypse just around the corner might look like. So, you know, around 2012, you know, with the, all the paranoia around the Mayan calendar, um, that the end of the world was coming, we had these eco-apocalyptic films like 2012 and the day after tomorrow and many more. Um, we've seen a revival of ideas from deep ecology and neo-Malthusian ideas filter in um, you know, with ideas about the generalized destructiveness of humanity or the population or population growth and quick fix silver bullet technical proposals of how to fix problems through easy and cheap solutions, um, whether this be Thanos' infinity gauntlet or offsetting to net zero or geoengineering. And we get warned about how people will live after the collapse. Now, Mad Max used to be, I think, about living after the nuclear apocalypse. But now Mad Max is about, you know, water wars and desertification and ecological collapse. The planetary story is the big story. Johan Rockström, who I mentioned before, says that the problems are all integrated, all shared on a global scale. From the planetary view, from the eagle's eye standpoint, there we are, a pale blue sphere hanging in space. From that standpoint, it makes sense that there is one humanity, one story, one science, one knowledge, one pathway, and one consensus hanging in the balance. But the world isn't a globe. A globe is a model, all smooth contours. The real world we live in has mountains and valleys, peaks and canyons, texture to human experience, magnitudes of inequalities in wealth, experience, and well being. The world is not a globe, the world is not an aggregate, and the world cannot, in real terms, be reduced to balance sheet maths or models. Cyberpunk science fiction author William Gibson is famous for saying, um, when, and he said this often when interviewers would ask him about the future, that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And I really think this is a useful way for thinking about the politics behind the big story, particularly when it's caught up in the idea that we have X number of years or X amount of time to figure out how to take action. It might be part of the big powerful story, but we aren't limited to the planetary story. There are so many other stories and we don't actually have 15 years or 10 years or five years to wait for a planetary silver bullet solution. I think that no lesson could convince us of this better than the uneven and unjust geographies of the coronavirus pandemic that's continuing to unfold right now. And you know, the, the planetary answers and the big picture stories, they're, they're just not working as, as, you know, they promised. 
So there are stories from science, there are stories from science fiction, there are stories from radical philosophy. Um, in a short pamphlet called The Coming Insurrection, written by a group called the Invisible Committee, they write that it's useful to wait for a breakthrough, for the revolution, for the nuclear apocalypse, or a social movement. To go on waiting is madness. The catastrophe is not coming, it's here. It's within this reality that we must choose sides. So where do we go from here? How do we choose sides? How do we ground planetary thinking? How do we connect the big picture, which is important to the smaller, deeper dynamics that also matter? A good place to start is with undisciplining ourselves a bit, stepping back from the big story, opening up to other stories from the world, paying attention to the politics of places where people are struggling against the damages of climate change environmental violence, resource injustice, dispossession, against sacrifice in all manner of forms. Rather than defaulting to the eagle's eye view, situating crisis and disruption in politics and ecologies of place can allow us to dig deeply and get an intimate, rooted, what you might call worm's eye perspective of how all manner of encounters, negotiations, alliances, resistances and disruptions build and transform worlds that people live in. For sure, these worlds include ecologies of crisis, zones of sacrifice and all sorts of terrible things. But they also include struggles for emancipatory ecologies that can be hidden by the shadows and beneath the rocks that are cast by crises that appear so big and so overwhelming that we feel like any action is just too small. Or maybe instead of the worm's eye view, we can take a lateral or spider's eye view, which can help us to better see the ways that people's struggles come together through networks that are produced by power relations and solidarities that intersect and weave across the world far beyond place-based dynamics of local resource conflicts. What patterns and projects and stories about the future might emerge from these different viewpoints? So I don't have all the answers. I don't really have any of the answers, but I do have a lot of questions. Um, and honestly, I wouldn't trust anyone who claims to have all the answers because surely they, um, they're not considering the deeper politics, right? Um, so I don't have all the answers, but I do think that pathways forward become clearer when we choose to engage the world as it is um, and learn how to ask the right questions. Um, so I offer in closing, in conclusion, um, a set of questions for 21st century resource politics. Um, whose interests do particular claims, whether we're talking about environmental change, about growth, about you know, any sort of dynamic, whose, whose claims are, uh, sorry, whose interests are claims serving? How does the distribution of power shape resource politics? How do the stories that we tell about resources, natural processes and crises shape the sorts of research priorities, policies that get favored and material reality that we experience? How do places and people enmesh in broader political economic dynamics? What changes are affecting people and, nat uh, and affecting nature and how are they doing this? Um, how do interactions at different scales affect people's lives? What are the intersections and relationships between environmental struggles and people's political struggles more broadly over labor, over uh, gender, over identity, over recognition? How can alternative stories, alternative visions for the future, alternative sustainabilities and vernacular notions of things like freedom, justice, and security guide our thinking and action. I really think that these, um, these questions and ideas that have always been or have grown really central to my work around resource politics, I hope that they can um, start you, you know, thinking about how, how your work might um, be related to these questions, whether or not you work um, in resource sectors or academia or not. I think, these, I think that these are important questions and issues 
uh, beyond research, but just, you know, thinking about our lives and, you know, the way we um, engage with the world. Thank you very much.